thank you so much for having me today. And I will start by the inviting you to travel back in time with me, specifically to October 2022, to Ukraine that's facing the Russian full-scale war. Entering October back then, we were already preparing for winter. Winter was coming, and uh, not only winter was coming, but massive attacks on the Ukrainian energy system as well. But what's interesting in this case is that not only the attacks itself, but the combination of disinformation, cyber, and the physical warfare. So we start October with actually the first very heavy missile attack on the energy infrastructure, synchronized right away with malign information campaign saying that Ukrainians will freeze to death and that the whole energy system will completely collapse. Not only that, but cyber attacks on the energy companies starting to kick in. Right after the first missile attack, the pro-Russian Telegram account started sharing this fake satellite picture saying that that's how blackout in Ukraine is going to look like. And that's something that we have to get prepared to. And with that in mind, actually, we again see the continuous cyber attacks, very small ones, minor ones, but constant and persistent, with actually moving forward with the different calls we see, again, on Facebook, on Twitter, back then it was Twitter still, uh, with a very weird call to action, call to unplug the devices, unplug all of the devices from all of the, uh, basically, your refrigerator, your phone, everything completely unplug, which actually was completely fake. But that was, again, an attempt to put an extra pressure on the energy system. And uh, you can imagine, like, Ukrainians being in that, hearing the missiles attack every day and um, suffering already from energy shortages, electricity shortages. What started is that malign actors started pitting one community against the other community. That was exactly the moment where we identified, this is just a few examples of multiple articles saying that all the light is sent to Lviv while Odessa is suffering. And in the eyes of the Russian propaganda and disinformation, uh, Lviv is considered to be a kind of a heart of the neo-Nazi thing, um, while Odessa is like on the other side of it because it's more of a Russian-speaking city. So they are trying to pit these communities with various fake footages of uh, light in, in Lviv, joyful life, while like Odessa is a allegedly suffering. And we see that, and this is actually the time when we also recorded fake apps of Ukranerho and the tech, which are again Ukrainian companies responsible for the energy infrastructure, appearing online. Because we were able to detect all of the things very, very quickly, the apps and the social media pages, the fake ones, they were taken down very quickly before they got any traction. However, judging by their content, uh, they were trying to uh, share the fake schedules for electricity shortages, which only after we learned that they were actually to do the more targeted campaigns, more personalized campaigns. And this was the time when everything was becoming more and more clear. Because imagine the security services of Ukraine we're recording 10 cyber attacks daily on the companies responsible for energy infrastructure. Again, daily, on the everyday basis. They were minor, and uh, judging by their nature, actually what the malign actors were trying to do is to get as many uh, personal information from this company as possible, to not actually to destabilize the companies, not yet, spoiler, uh, but to get as many information for them as possible to create even a more and more specific targeted campaigns 
on a very specific uh, communities in Ukraine. And this was exactly when we've seen so many, um, and they failed actually, that's the important thing, they failed with those uh, cyber attacks, but they had another means, means of disinformation. So they started creating these fake time schedules and again pitting communities against each other. Rich versus poor, multiple fake stories about like, oh, the mayor has the light while you all are suffering. And this is again all, all interconnected and intertwined. And this is actually when we had exactly the fifth huge attack targeting specifically energy infrastructure. And you can imagine all of that frustration of average Ukrainians uh, that are actually suffering from, back then we didn't have light for hours, days sometimes, like half a day, eight hours, nine hours. You see all of this thing when you have that light, you go on the online and you see all of this disinformation piling up there. And that was when malign actors knew that this is the time to channel that frustration. Here you could see the piece we identify in the uh, network of Telegram, anonymous Telegram channels, linked to some of the Telegram channels of Russian Garou and, and other Russian security services. Uh, these are basically guidelines in Ukrainian and Russian that they share on how to, with different messaging, that they ask their networks to promote to basically do the main thing, to destroy the trust. These are all of the messages aiming to destroy the trust to Ukrainian government, to Ukrainian military forces, and to Ukrainian companies responsible for the energy structure. But what was very peculiar, they not just call in general, they call to protest. And protesting in the amid the full-scale war can be a very dangerous thing. So we have spotted back then and we've seen all of this piling up, piling up. We, can, we see the continuous cyber attacks, small happening, missiles are happening. And then they were realizing, the malign actors, that there is no frustration enough. There is like, we need something else. So they've created like fake stories and even fake websites um, that were supposed to show that Ukraine is exporting energy abroad with the narrative that like, ah, oh, your government doesn't care about you, all they care about is making money. And then the second thing that they were trying to um, also bring lots of fake stories that there is a, allegedly a new tax introduced for the energy generators, which were back then like a saving thing for, for Ukrainians. Everyone had like at least one or more. So they were like doing that to completely uh, channel all of that frustration because there was basically the D-Day, the protest day, which was scheduled and announced beforehand with the specific locations. Um, it was interesting because the primarily target was Odessa as a city back then, but what caught our attention is that the same message was shared across basically whole part of Western Ukraine as well. Um, it's exactly the same message, starting from Viber, which was a bit unusual because usually it's Telegram. Uh, just the location is different. Like, let's protest here and here, and just like the, the location is different. And the location was actually um, either right in front of the office of the, the regional offices of the energy infra, uh, companies or somewhere right near there. So, now we see this. Now we see this extremely multi-layered, sophisticated campaign. And the very good thing um, that it didn't succeed. The biggest cyber attack failed. People didn't go to protest. And the question arises: why? Because as you see, it's a pretty sophisticated thing that should have worked. And one of the main reasons is actually because you, when you track the information space, when you know how to listen to information space, and when you consider disinformation as a security issue, you're able to spot all of the things beforehand. 
and actually most of the things were uh, identified and um, taken care of very, very quickly early on. But you may think this is uh, possible only in Ukraine because of the war, right, uh, such a thing. And unfortunately, war is not only in Ukraine, first. But second, we see more and more private companies suffering from state-sponsored disinformation campaign. So with that in mind, we created Let's Data, AI Radar Against Disinformation. My co-founder and I, we were working in this field for quite some time, and we've seen the repetitive request, repetitive again and again coming from different state agencies, later joined by the corporates, to how to actually find this best fit of the advanced technology and understanding of malign information campaigns that is much wider than just fake news that we are so used to, uh, to talk about. So how it actually works. So we collect millions of social media and media publications and process it in real time to get the early signals of malign campaigns. Interestingly, we don't care if it's true or not. Why? Because unfortunately we live in the world where the truth can be weaponized easily. That is why we look into things like coordination and intent. So we detect the things early on, we evaluate them based on their damage and velocity, uh, the client takes an action, and then we basically evaluate in the real time how you are doing. And uh, with that, basically, there are a few interfaces to that, how we have it right now. So there are alerts, which are basically about understanding what's happening, what kind of a shitstorm is going your way, basically, and that you have a time to take in proactive measures, because it's all about the proactive measures. Because once it's out there, it's a very different things you do. So our task is just to give you as much time for the proactive action as possible. Then we have, which for you cyber people is very known, is basically uh, how do we respond to that. This is a response and coordination system. This is something that could be easily, we could integrate to it, uh, to some other systems or do it on our, um, within our solution. And then basically the last part is that we have interactive reports that help you to track your efficiency, basically, as I mentioned, how you're doing in this information space and how your efforts are uh, making the difference. Because efforts are very, very much important. Proactive actions. Proactive actions like BlackBerry Fact Check that started straight away with filling all of the information gaps that could have been out there making it much harder for the malign actors to fill the information gaps or even to penetrate those information gaps themselves. So with all of that in mind, I would like to basically finish with a one final statement that this information is not a PR issue. It's not something that you could deal just within communication. Because as you've seen in this case, and this is a case pre-generative AI, right? Imagine now adding on top of that the generative AI. So that brings us to the point that being resilient to disinformation is thinking in the realm of cyber, information, communication, and cognitive security. So only if you think through this framework, you could be truly resilient to the modern challenges of malign information campaigns. Thank you.